Uh, what I want to talk about this morning is bored. <laughs> During the virus, has anybody been bored? A lot of people have gotten bored. It's just like, just sitting around, same house, doing the same thing over and over and over and over. Maybe some kids have gotten bored. But I want to talk about bored, you know, or restored. And I do believe that's what God's been in the business of doing is restoring people in the right relationship with him. And uh, this restoration is not necessarily a one-time deal. Anybody here got a knife? Nobody has a knife. Uh, okay, there's one lady back there has a knife. Okay, all right. Well, what happens? How many times in your life do you need to sharpen a knife? I can't hear you, dear. You got this mask on your face. If you use the thing, you got to sharpen it often, and I have to sharpen mine often because I'm always restoring the usefulness, restoring the edge. And they tell you people get hurt with a dull knife a lot easier. But restoration, it can be an ongoing process. It's not just one time I get restored, you know, but there's an ongoing process of restoration, you know. Anyhow, it says here in Psalms 23, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything. Now, what percentage is everything? Y'all didn't forget in the last five months, did you? Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. I have everything. He says, The Lord, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have 100% of what I need. Every wholesome desire... Every need that I have, I have it. That's, that's, what, that's what the psalmist said. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything, everything, 100% of what I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. Now, this whole topic we're talking about on restoration, what's this say? Restore. Well, what other word do you see hidden in that? Rest. You see rest. And in restoration, or the word restored, you see there's rest. And, and God is always really involved with giving you and me rest. I wonder if that'll stay up there all by itself. Ta-da. It was made for that. You know, but he says here, he lets me rest and there's a restoration. When you go to bed at night, that's to restore your energy. You know, I mean, you, you get rest and you get restored and rejuvenated and reinvigorated and, and all. But he says, he lets me rest in green meadows. That's where we get repaired and, and rebuilt and, and, and reconditioned and, and renovated. And he says, and he leads me, no more stumbling, you know, no more falling or going astray. It says, he leads me beside peaceful streams. And then it says in verse 3, he renews my strength. Does anybody know how, I, how it says it in the King James Bible? He restoreth my soul. God, my shepherd, he restores my soul. He renews it. You know, that's what we're talking about here. Are you just bored with life? Some people are. They do all kinds of things, try to, uh, you, know, so, you know, sedate themselves because of their boredom. But when God restores us, oh, man, that's a game changer. And it goes on to say here, he renews my strength, and the Lord alone can do that. And he gives, he guides me along right paths. Other passages, it says he, he guides me in the best pathway for my life. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. See, restoration, the restoration that God does brings honor to his name. When he restores you in the right relationship, brings honor to his name. If, if you had found an old, rusty, junk, falling apart old truck up on the top of a mountain in a junk pile somewhere, and then you were to bring it down, and you weren't at restoring it, 
People come around to you and go like, wow, man, you're awesome. The restoration process that you do, did brought honor to your name and the restoration that God's doing in so many people's lives and families and health and finances, it just brings honor to his name. People are going, wow, God, you're awesome. You, you're, you're amazing. It, it brings honor to his name. Now, this old building here, you know, we've been here for 40 years. This come in October. We've been here for 40 years. And uh, we spent a few thousand dollars on this old building <laughs> in the beginning. Well, the building was built in 1873. So we needed a lot of work to do just before we got into it. And uh, there's this, it's like a bug went in my mouth or something there. <clears throat> okay, I hope that take care of them. Um, restoration. It's an ongoing process, and we've restored parts of this old building many times. You know, and we're looking at right now because some of the foundations got some cracks and things in it, and we're about ready to do some more restoration on the old building. Restoring it for what purpose? Usefulness. That's what this old truck was not just restored so they could put it out as an ornament in someone's front yard. You could do that without an engine in it. But this old truck was restored for usefulness, to use that thing once again, you know, restoration cost somebody, you know, uh, when you and I have been restored to a right relationship with almighty God, it cost somebody. It was Jesus. What did it cost him? His lifeblood for you and I to be restored into right relationship with God. Verse four says, even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Lord, I'm not going to be afraid because you are close beside me. That, that makes the difference when God is close beside me. And see, if, if, if a guy's going to restore a truck, or you're going to restore a knife blade, or you're going to restore whatever, you got to be close. You can't restore that truck through Zoom. Are you all familiar with Zoom? Oh, okay. Well, we are. Because Zoom is where all of our meetings has been happening. You know, if you can meet with people all over the place, and it's on your little phone or it's on your computer screen or, or whatever or another. But you can't do certain things through Zoom, but to restore, you've got to have hands on there, and God is close to us as he works at restoration in our life. He goes on to say here, even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod Now this is a rod. This is a solid piece of oak. It's heavy. And uh I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end if somebody was coming after me with it. You know, I wouldn't want to be a bear if he was coming after me and this is all I had, you know, because I'll give it to him. And it says here, he says, your rod and your staff, and the ones that the shepherds had was like this. It was probably longer, a little bit bigger hook on it, you know, but he said here, he says, your rod and your staff, they protect me and they comfort me. You know, if, if you was a sheep and you saw an old wolf sneaking around the edge and the shepherd saw him too and the shepherd's going out of his rod, that shepherd has one intent, to bash the head of the fox, you know, or the wolf or the bear or the lion or whatever it might be. And there's this staff here, it's got this crook on it. So if, if a, a, a lamb or sheep gets into a real big briar patch and stuck and can't get out, you hook the hook into his, his wool and you twist it and you twist it and you twist it. It basically makes a rope on the end of it. And then you yank that lamb or that sheep out of the thicket. Now, he probably don't like the way it feels you pulling on his wool, but it keeps him from getting consumed in the briar patch, you know. And if he gets down, falls down a few uh, feet off of a little cliff to a little ledge, do the same thing. You hook it in his wolf, 
and you turn it and you twist it and you twist it and you pull them back up. Oh, lots of people think, you know, that they just hook them around the neck. So if, if I get to preaching long and one of these comes out that door there and they hook me around the neck, I mean, my time is up, right? But, and that is a practical use for it as well. But the Bible says our shepherd, he has a rod and there's only one purpose for that rod and that's to beat the enemy and a staff and that's to help me if I get stuck. And that's just the way it, way it is, you know. Put those back right there. But he says here, your rod and your staff they protect and comforts me. And you prepare a feast. I mean, a banquet. I'm talking about a feed. I'm talking about a spread. Whatever term you might use, an extensive meal, a buffet. He says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of mine enemies. And my enemies, you know, will only stand and stare. They will dare not attempt, you know, to harm you. And so you're not having to be looking over your shoulder every moment. It says our shepherd's going to protect us while we eat. And not just a little dry food real quick, you know, just eat it real quick and be done. He said a, a feast, a banquet. Our shepherd's going to take care of you even when the enemy's around and he's got a rod, and he's got a staff. This is going to protect, and it's going to comfort you. And he goes on to say, you welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. And what else does he say? You probably know what's coming. You know. My cup does what? Runs over. And you understand the concept. But our cup does not runneth over with water. Oh, thank the Lord. Had just enough there. But that don't really demonstrate that well, you know. Our cup runneth over. What does it say our cup runs over with? Blessings. He says, my cup, you know, there's water all over the place up here. That represents blessings. And it will take all the blessings that we can get. And he says here, you welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil, and my cup overflows with blessings. My cup. And, and I'm telling you, this is what our shepherd does. Even during the coronavirus, every good thing that comes your way, it came from him. And have, have any of you experienced the blessings of God during this whole pandemic? Anybody experienced the blessings of God? Absolutely. He has been awesome. He has been wonderful. And I, I'll tell you what, Susan, I, have you been bored really during this pandemic? No. We're putting in twice as many hours as we normally do, you know, to be honest with you. And uh, we've, we both lost about 25 pounds in the midst of it. And it's not because we didn't have no food to eat either, you know. It's constantly going up and down that mountain to pray for you guys and for everybody else, you know. But I am telling you, being involved in, and useful to God, it's the cutting edge and it's a thrill. It's what we were made for. It's what we were created for. That's just the truth of it. And uh, let me see here. In verse 6 he says, surely, this is the end of uh, chapter 23, says, surely your goodness and your unfailing love will pursue me all. Now what percentage is all? 100%. The goodness of God, the unfailing love of God is going to pursue you and me during a virus, during a pandemic, during a war. It don't matter. His goodness and his unfailing love is going to pursue you and me all, 100%, all the days of your life and all the days of my life. And I will live in the house, so I'm in the presence of the Lord forever. What percentage is forever? 100%, and that starts a long time ago. We're going to live in the presence of Almighty God forever. That's what he says. In Psalms 51, verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart. Oh, has your heart ever gotten dirty? The answer to that question is yes. Okay. We sin, and, and our heart gets dirty. And the psalmist said, create, or could be recreate 
something that you've already done before, or restore in me a clean heart, O God. And only God can create in you or recreate in you a clean heart. Only God can forgive you, you see. He's the one who forgives us, and he is the one who cleanses our heart. Uh, anybody here enjoy any form of recreation? Recreation? You understand that? But if you look at the word is re-creation. Re is doing something that's already been done before, you know. In recreation, it tends to restore our strength, doesn't it? It, it has a tendency to restore our sanity sometimes, you know. I see a little re, uh, you know, recreation, some recreation to restore my peace of mind because we kind of feel sometimes like we're on a little cage that the little mouse is on and you're going know, boogity, 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 boogity. And you're just running wide open. You don't seem like you're going nowhere sometimes. But see, in the beginning, God did what to Adam and Eve? He created them. Now, do you know the word create? A good definition for create, it means generate. So God generated. God generated Adam and Eve. He generated us. Last week, before the power came on, we were generating light and we were generating power in this whole building because we have a generator. It was creating something. And in the beginning, God generated us. And because of sin, we become degenerate. You ever heard somebody call, well, you old degenerate, you know? There's this degenerative disease, and it's called sin. So we were generated, and we become degenerate because of sin. And God wants to regenerate us. That's what I'm talking about. That means restore, you know, to renew, to, to revive, and, and so forth and, and go on. Listen to what it says here in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 3. It says, for we ourselves were also once, not maybe now, but once we ourselves were foolish. Uh, you ever been foolish? Disobedient, deceived, serving various lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Man, we was once that way. We needed some restoration. We absolutely, positively did. But it goes on to say in verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man, appeared... God showed up on the scene with his mercy and his grace and his love and his kindness. Oh, uh, let me digress in the moment here. Verse uh, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, We all are infected and impure with sin, this degenerative disease. Though God created us perfect, that's the way he wanted us to be, like his son, because of sin we become Degenerate. We have this degenerative disease, and it's called sin, you know. Uh, and it just, you know, deteriorates us, and, 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 and we worsen, and we just give up, and we just collapse and disintegrate. But he goes on to say, he says, We are all infected and impure with sin when we display our righteous deeds. When we display our righteous deeds, and, and let me tell you something, our righteous deeds are degenerative. The best good that you could do. Well, Lord, here, weigh all my good against my bad. And God goes, your good is bad. Did you know that? Your good without God, your good, the best that you can muster up to, to please God is bad. It says, we all are infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but what? I don't know if you understand that or not. But let me just illustrate what filthy rags are. Now, I know some of you want this because it's been hard to get during some 
parts of this pandemic we have here, right? I, f I probably don't need to describe this in any more detail, do I? You, you, you understand filthy rags there, don't you? And the Bible says our righteousness, the best that you and I can muster up without him, we can do on our own, the best we can muster up is filthy rags. That's the best you and I, well, here, God, look what I've done for you. And God goes, get that stuff away from me. Flush it. Get rid of it, you know. Get away from me. That's what the Bible says. Our righteousness is as filthy rags like autumn leaves. We wither and we fall and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Let me see if I have any... Is this autumn yet? Well, there's a few hurricane leaves in here too. And some of these belong to you, but they made it to my house. So please come and pick yours up and take them home with you when you get ready to leave. Okay? But so the best that you and I can muster up is just like autumn. They're, they're, they're drying and they're falling off the tree and they'll be swept into piles or burned up or something or another. And the best that we can muster up is as filthy rags and as autumn we leaves that are blown in the wind. That's the best you and I can do on our own. And so we cannot make it to heaven and we cannot please God on our own without what he does. Now, let me go back and read Titus to you. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It says, not by works of righteousness, which... We've done because the works that we can do is filthy rags and it's like autumn leaves. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done because they're de degenerative, but according to his mercy. And you understand mercy? It's not getting what you deserve. When a cop pulls you over for speeding and you're saying, you don't say, just give me justice. He'll go lock you up and take your car away, you know? When you were speeding, really. Over, way over. We said, show me mercy. That means don't give me what I deserve, please. You know, and that's what it says here. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, filthy rags. But according to his mercy, he saved us, saved us from sin. Through the washing of what? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we were generated. We were created just like a generator creates electricity and it, it, it generates, it creates power. We were generated. God generated us. And through sin, we become degenerative. And through what Christ has done for us, he says, regenerated, regenerated. We were generated. We were created, but we've fallen. And, and degeneration takes place and God recreates us, regenerates us. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, recreation, and renewing of the Holy Spirit. There is a renewal. There is a revival, a rejuvenation, a restoration going on here in this passage. And I'm telling you, there is a revival going on in this world right now. You go, well, I don't really see that. that. That don't make no difference whether you see it or not. There is a revival. There is restoration. There is this renewing going on right now. And if you'll pray, you, you'll see it's evidence of your praying, you know, this bringing about this transformation in people's lives. He goes on to say here in, in uh, verse 6, it says, whom he poured out, talking about the Holy Spirit, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Oh, that's what he's talking about. The Holy Spirit is empowering us to, to be able to follow what Christ wants us to do. It says in John 3, 3, Jesus replied, I assure you, unless you are born again, unless you are regenerated, recreated, unless you are restored, all means the same thing. He says, I'll assure you, unless you are born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. If God measures your goodness, which we have a demonstration of right here, he measures your righteousness and your good works 
to what Christ has done. It's just like, they ain't nothing to that. He said, well, that's the best I got. And, and your bad deeds and all, it's like, that don't mount up to nothing. But God comes in and he just forgives you. He just forgives it off. He forgives our sins and he renews us and he rejuvenates us, you know. And it says here in Psalms 51, verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew, uh, restore a loyal spirit within me. And God alone can bring about that transformation in your life. Uh, recreate, regenerate, renew, he says here, a loyal spirit within me. God can do that. He can. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They've been recreated, regenerated people, you know, restored to right relationship. And, and you may have drifted off from your relationship with God. We see people drift away from the relationship with people, and they do the same thing with God. And, and you can ask him, and, and he'll restore that relationship. He surely will. Anyhow, he says here what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore. They're not the same anymore for the old life is gone. You understand gone? You know, Susan had some cataracts a few years ago uh, due to she had this surgery. Uh, what was that? Uh, detached retinas and all. And through that process, she it created uh, cataracts. And then as time progressed, a few months down the road, and one at a time, they had to take out the cataract. Now, do you have a cataract in your pocket that I could show somebody? <laughs> they took the lens. Didn't they take the lens out? Yeah. When are you going to see if you could uh, use it every once in a while? What happened to it? It's gone. It's gone. There is absolutely no use in having that thing around no more. It says they are not the same anymore, uh, those who have been restored in the right relationship with God. New creatures, they are not the same anymore for the old life is gone. I don't see things the way I used to see them. My old life is gone and a new life has begun. Her vision is restored. Is that not true? Got rid of that old lens? It's gone. You don't want that back, do you? But your, your vision has been restored. That's what I'm talking about, you know. Now, when I was a teenager, before I wasn't a teenager anymore, I had started a lot of projects, but I just never would finish them. And my dad did not like that at all. And it brought conflict a lot of times. But I had an old 51 Ford pickup truck. That, well, he actually was his, but he gave it to me, and I'd started on it for years and was trying to work on it, this, that, and another. But finally, I got serious about it. And I restored that pickup truck. And it looked a lot like this, but it was a 51 Ford. This happens to be a Dodge. And I worked on that thing, 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 and, and uh, went to the junkyards and, and uh, scalvaged parts and this and that. And then I even painted the thing myself after it was all worked on. And I put a, I was a teenager, but I put this little wooden cross that I carved as a, as a hood ornament on the thing. You remember that truck, don't you? But you know what? I didn't just restore it to make it a, a, an ornament in our yard. I drove the thing. And, and God, he restores you and me to usefulness. And you may have felt that, well, God can't use me anymore because of something I've done or something I didn't do that I was supposed to do, possibly, you know? But, but you, know, you, you know what? The theme of this truck and the theme of my 51 Ford pickup truck was on the road again. I just can't wait to get on that road again. Going places that I'd never ever been. I can't wait to get on that road again to be useful. Not just to sit around and do diddly, do nothing and we've, we've lost our dreams and our, our goals and things like that. Well let me pick up here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Picking up in verse 18, it says, And all this newness of life, all this restoration is from God. Because that's what God does. 
He restores us in the right relationship. God will never, ever condemn you, ever. Never, ever will God condemn you. Never, ever, ever. See, condemning us, he convicts us. He convicts us to cause us to recognize, yeah, I shouldn't really be doing this no more, should I? But he doesn't condemn us, he forgives us. All this newness of life is from God who brought us back to himself. He restored us in the right relationship with himself through what Christ did, and God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. That's our purpose. No matter what your occupation is, we all have the purpose of introducing people to Almighty God. To, oh, I'm supposed to stay back here. I'm sorry. My wife threatened to put a chain on me so I couldn't go no further than that because I have a tendency to go past that sometimes. Stay back here, okay? I'm working on it. But I am telling you, God's crazy about you, and he, he's renewing and restoring our relationship, and then once we've been restored, he wants us to touch another friend, a family's life, and tell them about how much God loves them, and he's not mad at them. He's not going to condemn them. He, he's just going to restore them to usefulness, Bring back their dreams and fulfill those things and, and meet your, all your wholesome desires I'm talking about. See, everybody needs Jesus. And, and Jesus restores, he regenerates, he transforms. He, he does for you what he does for caterpillars. And he turns them things into butterflies. And he does the same thing as he restores you and me. He brings about this fantastic relationship with him. Changes everything. Psalms 51 verse 11 says, Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore. You see that word restore? Restore to me again the joy of your salvation. You know what I'm talking about? What are y'all doing here? Boy, how come you didn't comb your hair before you got here? Is this fire a sure fall? What happens when you lose your joy? You start acting like that. It's everybody else's fault. Everybody else has got a problem. And what we're praying for right here is like, restore unto me the... Oh, man, it's so good to see you guys. And I'm telling you the truth now. I was just acting a while ago. And he says here, this is our prayer, not, not restoring to me the, the joy that comes from a, a, a drug high. That's temporarily. And it makes you crazy and, and confused and do things you ought not to do. But we're talking about the joy of what? What does he say? Restore to me again. Because sometimes we lose our joy. Sometimes we lose our song. Restore to me the joy of salvation. My relationship with the almighty God, the joy of knowing that I'm forgiven. I am forgiven. This is fantastic. This is wonderful. I have been restored to usefulness that God has got a purpose for my life and for your life. And we need to maintain that joy. And the devil will do his darndest to steal your joy. What's it say in the Bible? The joy of the Lord is our, is our strength. And you lose your joy, you lose your strength. That's just the way it is. You just lose your strength. Okay, that'll be all right. It's tired. It's just going to lay down there for a while, okay? This is the psalmist's prayer, and it should surely be ours. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Because we might lose our joy from time to time. We get preoccupied with other things and we start acting like the rest of the world. And then he says, and make me willing to obey you. When you lose your joy, you're bored. And we need to be restored. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. In a remote Swiss village stood a beautiful church. It was so beautiful, in fact, that it was known as the Mountain Valley Cathedral. The church was not only beautiful to look at 
with its high pillars and magnificent stained glass windows, but it had the most beautiful pipe organ in the whole region. And people would come from miles away from far off lands to hear the lovely tones of this particular organ. But there was a problem. The columns were still there and the windows still dazzled with the sunlight, but there was an eerie silence. The mountain valley no longer echoed the glorious fine-tuned music of the pipe organ. Something had gone wrong with the pipe organ. Musicians and experts from around the world had tried to repair the organ. And every time a new person would try to fix it, the villagers were subjected to the sounds of disharmony and awful penetrating noises, you know, which polluted the air around. One day an old man appeared at the church door and he spoke with the sexton. And after a time, the sexton reluctantly agreed to let the old man try his hand at repairing the organ. For two days, the old man worked in almost total silence. And the sexton was, in fact, getting a little bit nervous. And then on the third day at high noon, you know, there's lots of good things that happen on the third day. <laughs> at high noon, the mountain valley once again was filled with glorious music. Farmers dropped their plows and merchants closed their stores and everyone in town stopped whatever they were doing and they headed for the church. Even the bushes and the trees of the mountain tops seemed to respond as a glorious music echoed from ridge to ridge. After the old man finished his playing, a brave soul asked him, well, how could you have fixed the organ how, how could you restore this magnificent instrument when even the world's experts could not? And the old man merely said, it was just an inside job. It was I who built this organ 50 years ago. I created it, and now I have restored it. It was an inside, it's an inside job that you and I so desperately need. God created us in the beginning and he alone can recreate or restore us. And he can restore to us the joy of our salvation. And that's what we need. That same restoration in our lives is that organ needed from its creator in the beginning. Psalms 119 verse 93 says, I will never forget your commandments. I will never forget your commandments. For you have used them to do what? To restore my what? Joy and what? Health. How, how many of you like having joy? How many of you like having good health? You know it says it in Proverbs chapter 4. He says, my son, pay attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them right there and let them get into your heart, through your eyes and your ears, get with your heart. He says, for my word is life to those who find them and health to their flesh. His word is. I mean, his word is health to our flesh. But it don't work just by rubbing it on us. It works by getting inside us our heart. This is what he says. I will never forget your commands for you have used them to restore my joy and health. Wow. God restores our joy and our health through his word. Recently, one of the testimonies at a missions conference was very powerful. It seemed to take the breath away from the people attending. It was the story of, of a blind woman by the name of Penna, and she was, she was blind, and she was listening, but she could hear, and she was listening to the Jesus film that they would show in the villages, and they showed it in her village as, as those with sight were coming to watch it. Penna was greatly moved when she heard on the film that Jesus restored the sight of a blind man. When Penna heard these words, she cried out, right there in the middle of interrupted the whole thing. I want to receive my sight too. I want to receive my sight too. 
at the conclusion of the film, a miracle took place. Pan I could see. And Jesus restored her sight. And as the mission conference attendees heard this wonderful story, they began to show great emotion for such a miracle. They were stopped of their emotional exuberance by the missionary as he gave them a reminder. The restoration of Panai's sight was not the greatest miracle. It was a miracle, but it was not the greatest miracle that evening. A greater miracle took place than the restoration of her sight. Panai received the forgiveness of her sins that night by trusting Jesus as her Savior. She heard Jesus speak the sweetest words of all. Your sins are forgiven. And did you know that's the greatest miracle? You're like, well, I don't know about that. A person can receive sight, and they can still live a selfish life and die and go to hell. When you receive Christ, and he forgives you, and he cleanses you, and he changes your direction, and your destination brings about transformation, not just of body, but of soul and spirit. That's what I'm talking about. Well, let me read that, that verse uh, Psalms 119, verse 107. And he says, I have suffered much, O Lord. Restore my life again, just as you promised. And God has promised in his word to restore you. That's what he does. He is the God of restoration. He is the God of transformation, regeneration. He revives. He renews. That's his specialty. That's what he does. Listen to what the Bible says about Peter. Here in Mark chapter 14, it says, All of you will detest, all of you will desert me, Jesus told them, talking to his 12 disciples. For the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and I'll meet you there. Okay, don't forget that. And verse 29, Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. You ever feel like you can be more faithful than everybody else? They may desert Christ, but not you. You ever feel that way and, and boldly make such a statement? Not me, Lord. You can always count on me, Peter said. Verse 30 says, Peter, Jesus replied, the truth is... This very night, before the rooster crows twice, it's two times, before that rooster crows two times, you will deny me three times. Verse 31, no, you're wrong, Lord. Now, you know what the word Lord means, don't you? It means you're in absolute control of every area of my life. You're wrong, the one who's in absolute control of all areas of my life. You're wrong, Lord. That's what Peter told Jesus. Verse 31, no, Peter insisted. Not even if I have to die for you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same thing. Look with me to verse 50. Meanwhile, all the disciples deserted him, and they all ran away. This is a, a, few, a little bit later on. And Jesus said this is going to happen. Verse 66, meanwhile, Peter was below. Now, they took Jesus. The, the, all the disciples ran, hid, and, and Peter followed from a great distance, seeing what they're going to do with Jesus. He followed from a great distance. They took Jesus into a chamber. You know, they were debating. It was an illegal meeting. They were debating what to do with him. They were going to beat him terribly the next day. But Peter was looking from a distance, trying to see, what are they going to do with my, my Lord, you know? Let me find out where I was at again. Verse 66. Meanwhile, Peter was below in the courtyard. And one of the servant girls, not a Roman soldier, but one of the servant girls who worked for the high priest, she noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. And she looked at him closely and then said, You were one of those with Jesus, the Nazarene. And Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. And just then, the rooster crowed one time. The servant girl, she saw him standing there and began telling the others, 
that man is definitely one of them. Verse 70, Peter denied it again. That's the second time he's denied Jesus. And a little later, some other bystanders began saying to Peter, you must be one of them because you are from Galilee. Verse 71, Peter said, I swear by God, I don't know the man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed. How many times is that? No, that was the second time he crowed. Read through it again. The rooster crowed only twice, and Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows two times. Read through it again. You'll see it. I had to read through it because I got confused there with it my own self, you know. And immediately the rooster crowed the what? Second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind, and before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me what? Three times and he broke down and he cried, and Peter was a bona fide failure. He had, you know, denied the Lord, swore about, disobeyed the Lord who he had lived with for three years, and he denied, he is a bona fide failure. He has missed the mark so far. How could he ever be trusted ever again? Oh, you know, will Jesus even love me anymore after all this? I've really let him down. You know, is there a place for me? Is there any purpose for life anymore? In 1987, AFC championship football game between Cleveland and Denver, Ernest Bynar fumbled the ball just as he got ready to score a touchdown. That mistake cost the Cleveland Browns the championship, a trip to the Super Bowl, and it's what most people remember about Ernest Bynar. Even though Ernest Bynar had an otherwise stellar 14-year career in the NFL and, as, and is ranked as 16th on the all-time rushing list, many angry Cleveland fans will not forget the infamous <laughs> fumble. And you know something? The devil does his best. He tries all the time to get you and me focusing on our fumbles. And he tells us, God will never forgive you for that fumble. You really dropped the ball and it costs dearly. You lost the championship. You lost the opportunity to go to the Super Bowl and, and you're a failure. And that's what Peter was. He was a failure because Peter fumbled the ball. Ever made a mistake? The devil ever tried to bring that mistake back up to you? Say, how could God use you or trust you after what you did? Oh, that's what we're talking about here right now, you know. The devil ain't going to let you forget your past if he can help it, you know? Well, if you'll remember, and we're not going to read through it now because I don't have the time to do so. I was going to preach three, three sermons in this one hour today, and I figured I better not try because you might not come back if I did that, you know? But what happened after that? And Jesus was crucified. Peter took his disciples. Well, he said, I'm going back fishing, guys. I'm going back to what I know how to do. And the, all the other disciples, and you can read it in John chapter 21, verse 1 through 17. You just don't have time to read it all right now. And he went fishing. All the disciples went with him. And to prove what a failure he was, they fished all night long, and they didn't catch one fish. He was big time. Failure was a capital F, you know. And then, as the sun was coming up that morning, they're coming into shore to dry their nets, get them ready for the next night's f fishing. And they saw somebody on the shore with a little campfire. Looked like they was cooking something. And uh, it was Jesus. He said, hey, guys, y'all got any fish? He said, no, we didn't catch nothing. And then this guy on the shore around the fire, who happened to be Jesus, said, 
Cast your nets over on the other side of the boat. Same kind of a thing he had told Peter when he called him into ministry. They didn't have nothing to lose, so they cast their nets there, and they caught 100, they counted them, 153 large fish, the Scripture says. And that's when Thomas says, Peter, that's the Lord. And Peter dove into the water. He wasn't waiting for them to drag all them fish in the net to shore. He swam to shore. His heart was breaking because he had fumbled the ball so bad with Jesus Talk to him. Would he, would he do something for him? And, and Jesus, he said, boy, you, you denied me. Is that what he said? You betrayed me. No, he didn't. He restored him. He says, uh, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And then Jesus asked again, Peter. And he used the word agape. He said, Peter, do you agape? That means a pure, unselfish love. He says, do you agape me? Do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I, and the Greek word here was phileo, which means I like you a whole lot. Jesus said, do you love me unselfishly? And Peter answered, Lord, you know I like you a whole lot. It was the word phileo. And then Jesus asked him the third time. He says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. He said, I still have a noble purpose for your life. He didn't condemn him. He forgave him. And maybe you feel like something if you have done this, like God can't really use you because he's all about forgiveness. He's all about transformation. He's all about recreating, regenerating reviving, renewing. He's all about that. That's what our almighty God does. Now, how are you spiritually? Somebody comes, like, hey, how are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing fine. 365 days out of the year. Oh, we're fine. That's, that's what we say, but do we really mean it? What if how someone says, well, how are you doing spiritually? Oh, we're fine. But if we'll honestly, Get honest with God and say, hey, Peter, well, I've, I've fumbled the ball a time or two and I'm not doing so fine right now. What will God do for us? Even if we're a bona fide failure in something, God will forgive you. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about instead of living a boring life, it's just with all your dreams that are crushed and everything's by... It seems like it's, it's all the good's all behind you and it's just empty and boring. God will restore you and he'll restore your joy and he'll restore your health and he'll restore your wealth. He'll restore your relationships. I am telling you that God is in the restoration restored for usefulness, not as a, 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 a symbol of, of, of something in the front yard or on the coffee table or just some little decoration, but God restores us to usefulness is what I'm talking about. This is what it says here in Joel. Joel chapter 2, 25 says, so I will restore to you, God, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust. I'll restore the years that the consuming locust and the chewing locust have taken away from you. Have you ever seen what the those old pestilence can do? Well, I brought y'all some kale from my garden. And I brought you some cabbage also. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> it's kind of like a wedding dress. It's very lacy-like. 
I don't think cabbage is supposed to look like that. And had a sunflower out there, and something ate the whole flower. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. And here's the kale. And if, you know what? I, I know y'all eat healthy and stuff, so I just wanted to leave this stuff here. So if anybody wants some of it before you leave, you're welcome to this kale, you know, and sunflower and the cabbage and stuff. It, it, that's part of the curse. All that pestilence. But Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. I will restore to you the years of crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts. I'm going to restore what the devil has stole away from you. I'm going to restore it to you. I'm going to restore to you what the coronavirus took away from you and your hopes and your dreams and to leave you bored and watching the same TV program for the 15th time. God specializes in restoration and he gives you a dream and he'll restore that dream and he restores you so you can be on the road again to usefulness is what I'm talking about. How are you doing today? How are you doing spiritually? Thank you. Got one person doing great. <laughs> but what I want to do, and I'm picking on you a little bit here, but what I want to do is that if, if, if you could use some of God's restoration power in your life right now for you personally on a spiritual note, or you got a friend or a family member who, who needs some restoration in their life. And you know, right now, we're really not supposed to lay hands on people and touch people and things like that. That's okay. God's been communicating with me at a social distance for quite some time now, you know. He's just been writing me letters, you know, sending me texts and things like that. But what I want you to do if you say, I want more, I want God to restore to me the joy of salvation, or I, I want, there, there's somebody in my, my sphere of influence that they need restoration. If that's talking about you, I just want you to stand and we're going to pray for you. See, I, I want restoration. I want transformation in my own life. There's somebody in my life right now who they just need this transformation and this restoration, and I'm standing in the gap for them right now. Would you come here and pray with me, dear? I think you are my wife. You take a mask off. Oh, yes, you are her. You can just lay right here. Oh, well, you got to get close to me in my mic for service both, okay? Is that all right? And if everybody would join their faith with our faith as we pray for you right now. Papa God, I lift up my brothers and sisters and you see what's, what's in their heart. You see them standing because they, they want your restorative powers at work in their lives right now. They want that transformation. They want restoration of health and wealth and relationships, and they want restoration for their family, for their loved ones, for their friends. God, we just come before you, and we exert our faith right now, almighty God, and we ask you for a miracle for each man, woman, boy, and girl in this room, and we ask you for a miracle for each man, woman, boy, and girl who's watching this, wherever it is, whatever day it is on, or listening to it. If we ask you for a restoration miracle to take place in their lives and restore the joy of their salvation and father though they or their friend may have fumbled the ball forgive them almighty God and give them the assurance that your forgiveness is real and it's a done deal just give them the assurance of that they're forgiven and they're saved and restore the joy of their salvation to them and you said the joy that comes from you is our strength give them strength 
Give them stamina, almighty God. And may they run the rest of their life with purpose, restored to usefulness again. I commit every man, woman, boy, and girl who hears this message, who hears these words, who's heard these, heard these scriptures, I ask you for a miracle in their lives. Yes, sir. Would you like to play something, dear? Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are the God of restoration. Yes, you are. And Father, we ask that you would restore, Lord, all that the enemy has tried to steal from us, Father. That you yes. would restore relationships. Yes. Father, that you would restore relationships between parents and their children. Yes, Lord. Between siblings, between brothers and sisters. Yes, Father. Father, that you would restore relationships between husbands and wives. Yes, Father. God. Father, that you would restore relationships between yes. friends, oh God. Father, we ask that you would bring restoration to our country. Yes. Father, that you would restore our country to yes, what Lord. you have designed it to be, oh God. Yes. Father, we know that our country was built on a foundation, a yes. godly foundation. And yes. Father, we ask that you would restore God our country yes. to that godly foundation again. Yes. Father, we ask that you would restore our cities and our towns, oh God. Yes. That you would restore peace yes, to Lord. our country, Father. We ask that you would send a revival, yes, oh Father. God, amongst, Lord, not only those of us, Lord, that are praying for revival, but Father, that you would send revival to those who don't even know what revival is. Yes, Lord. Father, that you would send an awakening yes. in our in the leaders of our land. Yes, Father. Father, that you would send an awakening, Father, to those that are yes. of college age, Father, that you would send an awakening, Lord, to those that are middle-aged and those that are elderly and those that are children and those that are teenagers and those that are young adults. Yes. Father, that you would send a revival and a restoration. Yes. Father, that we would all come back to you the one yes. who has built us, the one who has created us, yes, and Father. that you would restore. Father, that we ask that you would restore yes. health to those that need healing. Yes, Lord, Father we ask God. that you would restore the finances yes. of our country, but also as individuals, Father. Yes, Father, God. Father, we thank you that you are the God of restoration. Yes, you are. And we ask you to restore in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. And all those that agree with that says, Amen. Listen, thank you so much for coming and joining and being wait, with us. Wait. And, and I want you to wait right now because my wife is going to tell you something. Or maybe she's going to tell me something. The prayer of salvation. We didn't pray that prayer? We did. Wow. I did this morning up on the mountain at 630. <laughs> I forgot communion and to pray for the salvation. So listen. Those of you especially who's watching online, I've prayed and welcomed Christ into my life, and that's where restoration started when I was a teenager. And those of you who are in this room, some of you have already done the same thing I have, but maybe you've drifted off course, and it's time to reaffirm our faith or maybe to declare it for the very first time. Thank you for reminding me. Only one time in 40 years have I not prayed the prayer of salvation at the end of a service. So I ask you to reaffirm your faith or declare your faith in Christ for the very first time. Would you join me right now? Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. I believe that you love me. I believe that you love me. And that's why you sent your son Jesus. And that's why you sent your son Jesus. And he paid for my sins. And he paid for my sins. In full. In full. By his beatings. By the beatings. And the crucifixion. And the crucifixion. He paid for restoration. He paid for restoration. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that he's knocking at the door of my heart. And he's knocking at the door of my heart. And I open wide that door right now. And I open wide that door right now. And I welcome Jesus. And I welcome Jesus. As my Savior. As my Savior. As my Lord. As my Lord. And as my King. And as my King. I turn from everything else. I turn from everything else. And I put you first in my life. And I put you first in my life. And I receive your transforming power. And I receive your transforming power. In every area of my life. In every area of my life. Use me. 
use me in a way that honors you in a way that honors you and changes people's lives and changes people's lives in Jesus name in Jesus name amen